Welcome back to Huddle Up. Today we have the privilege of being joined by not only a Grey Cup champion, but the Grey Cup MVP as well. Alouette's quarterback, Cody Fajardo, is joining the show. Cody, how's it going? Oh, it's going great and uh, still still getting used to that uh, Grey Cup MVP attached to my name, but uh, it sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's definitely a warranted title for you because you just had such a great game in that one. But uh, how's life been since then? Uh, very movie-like, um, as you would expect. Uh, now being back home in Reno, it's a little bit different. Uh, back in our routine, back to being a dad, changing diapers, uh, you know, the, the normal dad duties, mowing the lawn. Uh, so less football stuff and more just actual life stuff. But uh, the, the entire week after... Uh, winning the Great Cup was huge. I mean, it was incredible to have my wife and my son along with me. The parade, the Montreal fans turned, showed out for us. They they were there, you know, a couple thousand plus. Um, we really felt the love in that city. And to bring the city back uh, championship where I believe the Great Cup belongs with so much rich tradition and history. Uh, it was It was awesome to be a small part of that. Is there a story or memory that you have from either the parade or celebrating that kind of encapsulates what you're talking about, the tradition, the history with this organization that you'll think about when you're reminiscing on this week, this experience, the Grey Cup win all these years later? Yeah, I mean, two things jump off at the top of my head. The first being... Um... The MVP chance when we were going, driving along during the parade, right? Uh, that that was really special to me and my family. And just uh, hearing people chant MVP, you know, as a kid, you grow up and you watch guys at the free throw line and people chant MVP or, you know, you see football players, they chant MVP. And then to actually have it to yourself, uh, it felt pretty good, not going to lie. But And then the other one was uh, when, when they announced Coach Calvillo, Anthony Calvillo on the stage and hearing the – roar of the, the crowd and just how much he means to that province and to that city because of bringing championships there. And then, you know, when they announced my name and getting a similar roar, and, and I know he's won more great cups than I have, but uh, just to kind of be mentioned in the same breath as Calvillo is uh, truly incredible because he's the top CFL quarterback of all time. And just to, to listen and see what he's done and just to have him as a coach is really projected my career in, in just such a great way but uh to hear my che my cheers kind of rival his cheers it felt felt pretty good <laughs> obviously your run was just so so special and i think i mean i'll say luke and i had the privilege of being there and being on the sideline and absorbing the emotion of of your team through that run but i want to go even further back than just just those three playoff games and talk about before the season because the cfl power rankings came out and they had you ranked nine out of nine to begin the season and obviously we know how that ended up so how much of a driving force was that for your team did it fuel you guys and how good does it feel to prove everyone wrong in the end yeah i mean some people had us 10th in a nine team league and uh that kind of got us fired up as well but to tell you the truth when we had we had so much turnover this off season from the top all the way through and when people count you out, it, it almost brings you closer together. And a lot of times you don't see that in a first year team with a new head coach, new quarterback, a new owner, like a lot of new players on the roster. It usually takes them a couple of years before they're competitive. Uh, but I think the biggest thing was all of us, and, and I keep calling us the band of misfit toys, but those guys who have been exiled or these young guys, and, and basically people are telling you, you're not good enough it brought us all closer together. And so from the start of training camp, we talked about the great eight and being the eighth um, great cup champions in the Montreal Alouettes organization. And coach Moss wasn't afraid to talk about the great cup and wasn't afraid to talk about it. We have a great cup winning roster. And I think the belief from management and from coach Moss, it started to trickle down into the players and the players are like, yeah, we, we actually have a really good football team. And so you could see that over the course of the, the season play out and, you know, you couldn't tell if we were on our eight game winning streak or on our four game losing streak. Uh, this team was all about streaks. It seemed like, you know, either we we're on a winning streak or a losing streak or back on a winning streak. It wasn't like a win, a loss, a win, a loss. You know, it was all about streaks. So um, you could see that guys didn't hit the panic button when we were on a four game losing streak. We knew we were young. We knew we had to iron out some things and we knew we had some time. Uh, fortunately, we won enough games early on to put ourselves in a position where we didn't have to win all the games on the home stretch. 
which we ended up doing, but uh, it just made our, our course or our path to that great cup a little bit easier. But like you said, I mean, when everyone counts you out, it's that uh, little motivation that may be extra that you need. But as a professional athlete, when you're playing for your livelihood, for your family, for your name, uh, there's really not much motivation other than trying to support your family. So when people tell you you can't do something, you're going to try your hardest, whether they believe you can do it or you can't. Speaking of the Grey Cup, the game, the moment, the week, I read somewhere that you eat the same Subway sub before every game. Couple questions. <laughs> when did that start? And was that difficult to do on Grey Cup Sunday given the atmosphere of the game? It's definitely a little bigger than a normal kind of game day routine. So was that easy to accomplish that part of your routine? You know, yeah, that's a, a great question. It's something I picked up from Ricky, uh, Ricky Ray. So we were roommates in Toronto in 2017, roommates on the road. And uh, he'd always be like, yeah, I'm going to Subway. And I was like, all right, I'm coming too. And I'm, I'm always thinking in my head, like, this guy's got been in the league for 15 years and all he needs is a Subway sandwich to go out there. And, and we win a great cup that year, right? So uh, I kind of just implemented that into my my ways. And I haven't really stuck to it. Like some game days I would do it, some game days I wouldn't. This was the first year, I will admit, that every single game day I had a Subway sandwich. And uh, luckily and fortunate for us, where we were at in the Sandman, there was a Subway about a mile away. So I just put my headphones in. I walked about a mile, uh, got my Subway sandwich, walked back, hopped on the buses. And so it was very convenient. And and Subway is one of those things, especially in Canada, there's one on just about every street corner. So it's a very convenient when you're playing road games, you can pretty much find a Subway every, anywhere you want. And then home games, right on my exit on the Metro, there's a Subway right across. So I go grab my sandwich, walk to the stadium. And so that's just been my routine. And uh, maybe I can get a, a Subway gift card or something here in the future for giving them some shout out. <laughs> I was going to say maybe a little bit more than a, a Subway gift card. We got to get you as the, the poster <laughs> boy for the company over here with that game day routine. I don't think we've heard that from any player so far. That's awesome. But I want to ask you about something other people also might not know. And not only are you a star in the football field, but you're getting it done out on the dodgeball <laughs> court as well. How did how did that career kind of get get started? I've always had this ever since like high school. I've always had this love for dodgeball just the competitive nature and you know being a throwing position or a quarterback like you want to use your arm talent that god's blessed you with and uh, none other than throwing at people you know sometimes you're, you throw balls obviously in football to get caught and to score touchdowns but it's a little bit different level when you throw it at people and you, you hit them pretty good in the arm or the leg and uh, but it's something that uh, here in, in reno nevada it's a, a charity for the math club uh, for the university of nevada and one day they reached out to me and they said, Hey, do you want to form a team? You know, we know that you're the starting quarterback for the university of Nevada. I was like, absolutely. I'll do it. And it's been one of those things we've done every year. We've won the championship every year. So I think they're growing tired of us uh, coming in and, and taking the championship and leaving, but uh, it, it's, it's all for a good cause. And honestly, we have a ton of fun uh, doing it. And I know all the guys that uh, do it with me always have a lot of fun, but uh, I, I can say this and there's a lot of things I'm very humble about, but the one thing I'm not humble about is my dodgeball record. And I have yet to join a tournament and not win the championship in dodgeball. So there you have it. My, uh, my cockiness comes out in dodgeball. <laughs> That's uh, that's amazing. We got to get you out there for like a CFL all-star dodgeball game or something to, to see you in action. Um, but I want to ask you about the viral speech because I probably watched it on YouTube maybe 10 <laughs> times. It fires me up every time. Is that something that was kind of just spur of the moment kind of thing? Or did you have that plan because you knew the effect that it would have on your teammates? Yeah, it was more spur of the moment. And to tell you the truth, like, I'm not a rah-rah guy. Like, I'll, I'll talk to the offense and I'll just tell them, like, how I feel about this week. And a lot of times leading up to the game, like on day four, the day before the game, I'll always have a meeting with the receivers and I'll be in front of them. And I'll just give them, you know, some attaboys and just kind of fire them up. But it's not like getting up there and screaming and yelling. And then Coach Moss on day three, so two days before the game, he said on day four, the day before the game, I'm going to open the floor and whoever's won a great cup or ever wants to talk to the team, you're more than welcome to talk to the team. So that night I just was kind of thinking and I was like, should I do something? Should I not? I was like, yeah, I probably should. And I was thinking, how am I going to get these guys' attention? Because everybody knows who I was throughout the year. And I was like, well, 
I don't cuss a lot. So if I put profanity in there, I think people will listen. And I really don't yell that much. So if I slam the table and yell, I think I can get some guys' attention. And so I just kind of pieced something together. Like I, I knew I wanted to say the F you watch, watch this part of it, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to say. Um, but after, after when I got up there and I did it, you know, the amount of people that came up to me and just one had tears in their eyes or had chills or said they wanted to, they were ready to run through a brick wall. It was like, I hope I didn't make these guys peak a little too soon uh, on day four, but uh, it was, it's one of those things that I'm, Honestly, I wish it was kind of quiet and kept to the team, but everybody learned about it. So I'm kind of happy that there was actual film and footage and we were able to win the Grey Cup. So you can share that story. And it, it just kind of adds to how big that week was and how much it meant to a guy like me and guys in that room. And I, I was willing to do whatever it took to win that football game and, and prove that to the guys. And I think that's where the speech came from. I just wanted them to know that uh, this opportunity doesn't come very often. And when it does come around, uh, I'm, I was thankful for the opportunity and that I was going to leave everything I had on the field for them because I appreciated them having my back all year. One of the cool parts about the speech and all these moments too is that your son not only got to experience them with you on stage, but he'll be able to watch these for years to come. As a fellow Luca, I noticed the <laughs> Italian lineage of the name Luca, so I have to ask, what are the most Italian things about Cody Fajardo? Whether it's like a food dish that you love or Scoppa playing Italian cards, like what things are the most Italian things about Cody Fajardo? You know, honestly, uh, Italian food is something I love. I love the family oriented way that Italians eat their food and just how it's just a lot of food on the table and you just pass and serve and pass and serve. It's not like you're just sitting down with your little plate. And so I, I think we, we do that, you know, once or twice a week, um, just a bunch of food on the table and pass it around. And then honestly, when my wife and I took our, it was our baby moon, uh, when she was pregnant with Luca, we went to Italy uh, for, for 10 days, spent time in Rome, Florence and Venice, and just kind of just learning the culture and just being a part of that and waking up. And I'm not a coffee guy, but uh, going over there and, and drinking coffee and having those early morning pastries, just stuff that you don't get in the U.S. or Canada. Uh, it, it just was something completely different. And then we saw Luca all over the place when we were in Italy and we're just like, that's the name. That's the name we want to go to with. I always wanted a name, and I don't know if you know this as a fellow Luca, but I always wanted a name that kind of meant something, but Luca meant a bringer of light. And we felt like when we had Luca, he was going to bring a lot of light and a lot of happiness. And the crazy part is when we had Luca in, in Sask, we lost seven straight from when we had him. And so we were thinking like, where's all this light that we uh, brought? But to tell you the truth, it was, it was a huge blessing because – Football wise and my career wise, it was probably the lowest point of my life. But in terms of outside of football, I was probably the happiest I've ever been because we had a healthy son. My wife went through a healthy pregnancy. And so it was one of those things that kind of equaled me out. And if I didn't have my wife and my son with me, it would have been a really dark time. And now this year was the bringer of light. And uh, I, I'm so happy that, you know, it kind of worked the way it is because now he's a little bit older where you can kind of remember those things and he can be in those pictures and he can look back and, and remember them as opposed to when he's a newborn, you know, it's just all mom and nothing about dad. So uh, those are the things that just jump off when you, when you say Italian roots and you say Luca, it's like, I'm just so thankful to have him up on stage with me and have those pictures for the rest of our lives. Well, when you're in Toronto next year, I'll have to bring you some of my Nona's rice balls. They're fantastic, and we'll, <laughs> we'll have that along with the Subway sub as your pregame meal. Without a doubt, that sounds amazing. <laughs> All right, Cody, got one more question for you, because I'm sure you remember during Grey Cup week, you were shown one of the best highlight tapes ever from a men's league quarterback, and you told me that you would have me out in Reno, Nevada anytime I wanted <laughs> during the offseason for some quarterback, for some much-needed quarterback lessons now i got a little update for you since then i had a football game last week my men's league and it was not good not enough points <laughs> scored way too many interceptions we got blown out and i gotta ask does the offer still stand for me to come out to reno because i'm in desperate need of it right now <laughs> without a doubt and you if you know me if you know anything about me i love a good comeback story so don't let that one bad game uh define you don't let the the naysayers define you because the next week you can go out there, you can go for 290 and three touchdowns and 
you know, win yourself a great cup in, in that, uh, in that flag football league. So uh, I, I love a good comeback story and the offer will still stand. You make it out to Reno. I will uh, take your raw talent and, and hopefully bring you to another level. <laughs> We can't wait for the trip to Nevada. And before we end the show, we like to end it with three downs, obviously, CFL. So we're going to ask you to list your top three. And it's inspired by your pregame speech, obviously. So top three speeches, pregame speeches in a football movie. It could be a sports movie in general, but we can try and stick to football if uh, if we can. Yeah, Al Pacino, any given Sunday has got to be number one, right? That's uh, got to be the best. Um Remember the Titans is up there. There's a couple speeches in, in that one that, uh, you know, I don't have fully memorized, but uh, I do remember when you watch that movie and you're just like, okay, I, I would play for a coach like that. And then trying to think, you know, uh, I, I would, I want to get away from the football theme, but one of my favorite movies is the replacements. And, uh, and it's not so much a speech as it is the halftime um, interview that the head coach does when, um, uh, when Shane Falco's not playing in the game and they got T Martell back and he's just pointing to his chest and he's like, we got to have, you got to have heart. And, uh, and Keanu Reeves is obviously watching. And, and he, so he comes back at halftime. So uh, those definitely are, are the top three. An honorable mention would be the Bobby Boucher halftime speech. Uh, that's just obviously funny, but uh, I think Al Pacino that, you know, in high school, we watched, we had a highlight tape each week and the Al Pacino speech was always like in this music and it was always in the background. And so that speech is really close to me because I listened to it every single week in, in high school football. So that was to be definitely number one. Remember the Titans, there's a couple, like I said, and then number three being replacements. Awesome answers as always. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us today, Cody, and congratulations on all your success. We're going to continue to root for you and continue to watch League closely come next year. But enjoy the offseason. We'll see you out in Reno, Nevada sometime soon. Yeah, possibly. That'd be good content for sure. <laughs> all right, fellas. Have a good one.